Hi all, so I didn't manage yet to create the documentation of my architectural decisions. That's why I'm recording this video for you so I can explain everything regarding this task specification and you will make sense about how I did it. So I have started with brainstorming the idea of how we can achieve such a scalability that described in this task so we can handle like 10,000 requests per second with the ability to scale horizontally. And this is the architecture diagram I came through. So basically, if it comes to the uh, basic monolith architecture, you would just have this auth API service that connects to the Postgres database and then perform all of these operations. However, when it comes to the higher load, like 10,000 requests per second, uh, we have a bottleneck here and a bottleneck is a Postgres because the auth service could be scaled horizontally to the unlimited amount of replicas. However, the Postgres could not be scaled horizontally in a like, complete manner. However, we can achieve some partitioning or scalability of the Postgres by sharding or by uh, replicating uh, write with reads by creating read replicas. And uh, <clears throat> the other alternative approach to improve the scalability of such architecture is to use the distributed database. In most cases, distributed databases are NoSQL. However, there are databases like uh, CockroachDB uh, and, and a couple of others that are Postgres compatible SQL databases and they could be distributed. So they could have multiple write replicas, multiple read replicas, and they are synchronized so they could be deployed by multiple regions. And uh, like just if you think about this task straight away, this approach might be the most convenient. However, I prefer to achieve scalability on the service level as much as we have before thinking about database scalability. And I have um, explained this in this diagram over here. So uh, when it comes to the post register uh, operation, uh, this endpoint will handle some uh, basic user information like email, password and so on. And I made this operation asynchronous. Uh, why? First of all, because uh, when he's a register, he doesn't expect to receive uh, some information back straight away. He just wants to make sure that the registration happens successfully. Uh, the, the second motivation for making this operation asynchronous is, uh, is that we want to control the, the right load to our Postgres database because we only can have one uh, right instance and it means that we can't scale it horizontally we can only scale it vertically so that's why um, I've decided that if we if we optimize the database as much as we have using connection pooling multi-partition table and we will control the number of of writes and also we can perform writes in batches so the post register point pushes the the data to the message broker and then the command processor service subscribe the message broker and the, the, this service actually um, pulls messages like every second or so and he inserts them in batches so instead of all service inserting each record into the database uh, creating a transaction for each insert that is highly like performance uh, costly right it, it consumes a lot of performance we we doing it in batches and thus it has a significant performance improvement and it will it will work well on on the scale um the only downside of this approach is that uh i mean it, it shouldn't be the case for for real world scenarios but maybe for the law test if we have a lot of like requests and then the the uh, the message broker like got like I don't know ten hundred thousand of, of messages over there, and they are all just processing by the processor. And when user register it, it might in the higher load it might take up longer than one second. So when he he clicks login, it might be the case that the register operation asynchronous operation didn't get finished, and he. He already attempted to log in and he, he got an exception with that, so he need to wait and try again. This is not okay. However, I, I have not yet practically tested this, this scenario, so I can't tell 
uh, what will be the threshold of the load that we we should expect while this separation is happening. Uh, that's why I'm still remaining with this approach. Uh, so the second the second operation is login. So once the user is registered, the, the login happens. So what, what basically happens during the login is that the the endpoint of login it uses the read replica of the Postgres to read the user information uh, that was supplied during registration. He compares MDH hashes of the password once the authentication submitted. Uh, this this operation creates the session and I've decided to store the session in the Cassandra database because it's no SQL database is distributed it doesn't have the strict schema and uh, like such such record like sessions they are not really sensitive to data consistency while uh, when it comes to the user records they are sensitive to data consistency and we want to have them consistent that's why we're storing in the Postgres but um, I've used Cassandra for that. And honestly, we don't need Cassandra database for this particular prototype. However, I just included it to the diagram uh, for the maybe longer term reference, because uh, if we will grow a project like this, we will eventually want to have the historical record of the sessions of the user, or maybe we'll want to have the functionality that will allow user to uh, like manage multiple sessions, multiple devices from one place. That's why we need some store for the sessions and we can store the sessions uh, technically we, we we don't need to store sessions anywhere because we're using the G jwt token and that's where we're storing the session in the client side and once this token is validated we just can understand the session however as i mentioned for the some future prospects when when we we want to decide to have the uh, session management, centralized session management, that might be useful. Also, this in point uh, writes to the Redis. So the session is written to the Redis, and Redis is a cache. And why it's written to the Redis? Because Redis has super low latency. It's like its caching solution keeps everything in memory, and it has super low latency. And then um, Redis could be scaled also by write and read replicas across the regions. And then uh, lately, when we retrieve the get session point, we can use Redis, and this this request will be super scalable and have super low latency. So this is the, the post login is all about. And then the session, as we just tell, it just reads reads Redis, right? It reads from Redis. It has super low latency. It's scalable, so uh, there shouldn't be any issues over here. By the way, regarding scalability of the login uh, request, so we can achieve horizontal scalability over here because we can uh, add unlimited amount of Postgres read replicas. So if we have 10,000 requests, that's fine. We can just add more replicas and split the traffic uh, throughout these replicas. And then um, this, this request is handled. The same for Cassandra. We, we can have just write replicas in Cassandra and write whatever amount we want. We can split it. The same for Redis. Redis is just lightweight cache, so uh, we, it could be scale split. There is no right problems on these areas. And the read over here. Uh, when it comes to the session, there is also no problem here because we can like spin up multiple Redis replicas and read the sessions and it's going to be super scalable and hand, handle the higher loads with a really small latency. Um, Additionally, we can extend this logic if, if for some case the information Redis that might not be persisted lost, we can just go back to Cassandra, retrieve it, and write it back to Redis and return it to user. But yeah, it's it's more advanced scenario. And then the, the final step is logout. And what logout does, it's basically, first of all, it uh, it just uh, removes the the Redis from re the the record from Redis, so we are removing the session cache from Redis, and put the ma and put the message in the message broker. And why we put in message in the message broker? Because we don't want uh, we don't want to uh, first of all consume additional time of the service with with the asynchronous operation. So we don't need to do it asynchronously, right? We don't need to return immediately some information from the database. We just need to say user, okay, you're hitting log out. And, and second of all, 
we can do the same as we did with the Postgres. We can just we have a lot of, if we have a lot of logout requests like ten thousand minutes or something, we can just batch batch update them in the Cassandra. And Cassandra actually we, we don't delete the session record, we just update it. We just putting that uh, like session finished at that time and then we know we, we store it for a historical purpose. And uh, yeah, it's, it's much better because we can have a separate replica for Cassandra that works with common processor and common processor just work asynchronously and we just decrease the load from the Cassandra database that way. That's why we have, we, we have these two operation asynchronous. So this is the page architecture of how I see the solution could be implemented. And I have also started implementing it and have some source code and I will share it with you in the Git repository with instruction of how to run it.